presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to uh, Phil in Puerto Rico. Hey, Phil, what's going on? Hey, Tom, doing great. Um, just wanted to thank you guys and the whole crew. Best content on the internet. Really appreciate everything you guys are doing. We appreciate you growling and prowling with us out here. Phil, how did you find us? I just typed in live trading and you YouTube one morning. Cool. I was looking for any type of live trading room you guys came up in. The, awesome. I know the quality when I see it, or at least I like to think so. And uh, I mean, you guys are just a dream. I appreciate everything well, you guys do. Welcome to the Tiger family. We appreciate your growling uh, problem with us. Uh, my pleasure. Now, Tom O'Brien. Welcome, everyone. This is Jake. Well, put this on and may help a little bit. This is Jacob Shoup. You are watching the Tom O'Brien Show. It is a Friday, so you have to forgive the uh, microphone mishap. Let's take a look at what we got going on. Obviously, a lot uh, to talk about today, <laughs> especially with some of my calls I made yesterday. We have the composite up about 0.94%, that the NQs up about 0.79%. The Dow Jones Industrial trading up about 0.89%. Uh, down futures as well, up roughly the same there. Uh, the E-mini up about 0.58, and then the SPY itself up about 0.67%. Uh, the dollar had a little bit of down movement earlier this morning, but uh, we're right back up, trading at 104.28. Still, the, <laughs> the American economic numbers that are coming out, right? Um, even there, if there were some kind of shaky numbers, especially with some of the job reports, um, it's not that bad. I think we're still on. I think we're still on uh, track for two twenty-five basis point cuts uh, until the end of the year, right? When you have the rest of the global economy a little bit shaky, people are going to come to the dollar in those circumstances, and uh, yeah. So any kind of like momentary movement down, I, I think we're still in this kind of. We've been consolidating recently, but I could see this one hundred four staying, uh, you know, somewhat for a long time until you get some major. Uh, kind of cuts, right, that start to take effect, I would say. And then also you start getting kind of improving uh, economics globally as well. You have crude oil back up uh, 0.39, but not really doing too much, still at 69.53 on that contract. You had Iran come out and say that they were going to do another retaliatory strike on Israel. Uh, it seems like the market is not really reacting to that in any major way uh, like it was prior. I also don't fully buy that that was the reason why you had gas running up that, or excuse me, crude oil running up that high. Uh, but anyways, you have uh, gold coming off a little bit today, trading at 2,745. It's quite a pullback uh, from some of the highs, but we're still uh, trading quite higher. Of course, the high that we made, I believe, two days ago at, what is that? 28.01, 80 cents, nice. Copper up about 0.47%, trading at 430. You have silver off about 0.7%. And the Russell trading up 0.61%. Oh man, what else do we have going on? Well, I think I need to talk about this. Uh, that's going to be Intel. Okay, so what happened? <laughs> I ended this show yesterday. I mean, we're up 8.5%, right? I ended the show yesterday. I think it's not you know, any secret that I don't really like this stock right now. I, I don't like it. any kind of prospects it has going forward. Uh, let's talk a little bit, I guess, about it. We're, I'm going to go through what they released in the press release as well. Give me a second. Let's pull this over here. Okay. So they had third quarter revenue of three uh, thirteen point three billion. You have a loss of about three eighty eight on uh, GAAP EPS non GAAP attributable was a loss of forty six cents. Uh, loss of 389 impact on the gap EPS tribute to Intel from th so this is what a lot of people are saying is why it's an okay time to get in here right is because some of this major L with the EPS was from these impairment charges right this isn't going to occur you know going forward and you have 2.8 billion of restructuring charges and a 63 cent impact to the non gap EPS uh, from these 3.1 billion of impairment charges as well. They say they're making significant progress on a plan to deliver $10 billion in cost reduction in 2025. You know, that's good, 
I guess, right? And, and they need to do something like that, but it just doesn't make it still attractive in my opinion. We're gonna go a little bit deeper as well as to why I think some of the other stuff they're talking about is maybe uh, a little bit optimistic as well. It forecasting fourth quarter 2024 revenue of 13.3 billion to 14.3, expecting fourth quarter gap EPS of 24 cents of a loss there. Okay, so our Q3 results underscore the solid process, excuse me, progress we were making against the plan we outlined last quarter to reduce costs, simplify the portfolio, and improve organizational efficiency. We delivered revenue above the midpoint, which is, I think, partly why this is running up today, because uh, it wasn't as bad, right, as some people had uh, anticipated. Uh, you know, I, I suppose me included, right? Um, I, I wouldn't have imagined something like that. I didn't think it was going to be like... Uh, any more abysmal than anyone kind of anticipated. It just didn't seem like an attractive play, right? At least on my end. Uh, the momentum we were building across our product portfolio to maximize the value of our x86 franchise combined with the strong interest Intel 18A is attracting from Foundry customers. This is the thing that they are riding on heavily, and I think it has a problem with it, right? In the past, what was going on is they weren't able to produce enough of this at any kind of yield that was commercial, right? They say at this point that they have gotten that kind of tolerance to point two roughly, right? Uh, and that means you get something like a, above 80% or even higher uh, of, of efficiency in the production of this, right? So, so you know, uh, exceeding 80% of the, the chips are usable. And they said that they're going to be able to start mass producing this 2025. There are like notes from suppliers. This is coming via Reuters, right? Saying that that actually might not be the case, right? So they claim the defect density has reached, uh, reached below 0.4 defects per square centimeter. That's what you need, you know, below that essentially uh, for this to be uh, marketable in any way. The planning documents, however, from a supplier suggest potential delays as a digital design kit is still awaited before proceeding. Sources suggest that a large scale production using Intel 18A might not happen until 2026, which is a little bit off from what Gelsinger is saying. Now, you could also argue that or we're able to start producing them at some, you know, meaningful amount in 2025. But, but when do we start seeing, um, you know, meaningful revenue from that, right? So then additionally, restructuring charges uh, meaningfully impacted Q3 profitability, and we took important steps towards our cost reduction goal. The actions we took this quarter position for us improved profitability and enhanced liquidity as we continue to execute our strategy. Still got a lot of time going on for that as well. Uh, let's see what else. Take a look at this here. Yeah, so in Q3 24, you have the CCG group down 7%. Data, this is the saving grace, right? These, and I think it's really the Xeon chips because nobody's using, okay. We'll talk about this when we get back because I still got a little to talk about on it. And I think there are some issues still. spend any time online researching trading techniques on how to begin your trading journey, you've no doubt come across many folks who push Forex trading as a way to make big money quickly. Unfortunately, there are equally as many stories of these so-called Forex professionals just looking to make a quick buck off aspiring traders without actually teaching the ins and outs of the Forex market. This is what sets Teddy Kekstack's The Tiger Forex Report off the riffraff. Every Monday, former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member and author Teddy Kekstad releases his Tiger Forex Report newsletter, where he dives into the complex world of Forex and takes time to actually teach you his methods that have made him so successful in the fast-paced and rewarding world of Forex trading. Furthermore, all subscribers receive access to archived live streams of Teddy's, where he provides university-level education to help you in Forex trading. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Forex awaits.
Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. Building wealth trading in the stock market seems impossible to most people. They think it's too volatile and risky. Most people aren't going to take the time to educate themselves on how to do it right. But you're not most people, are you? At TFNN, you'll get the guidance you need to refine your strategies and techniques to invest like a pro. Because you'll be a pro. All TFNN subscriptions, books, software, and courses are available at TFNN.com. And I'm even going to tell you how to get them for less. Use TFNN's Tiger Dollars and you'll get up to a 20% bonus on your purchase. And once you apply them to your account, Tiger Dollars are automatically used for all future or recurring charges. Tiger Dollars also never expire, are fully transferable, and are a great way to add savings to your newsletters or services. Become the investor you were born to be at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Welcome back, everyone. This is Jacob Shupi. You're watching The Tom O'Brien Show. Before we went to the break, we were talking about Intel, uh, kind of looking forward for them. They are up uh, roughly 8% today on news that they're, they're in the middle, essentially, of their forecasts, right? Their big thing that is really the only thing, honestly, that's positive sides for the network and edge is this data center and AI. And in the data center and AI, they're kind of, supply chain that they have are these Xeon processors, uh, the Gaudi AI accelerators, which just aren't being used, it seems like, um, some kind of Ethernet technology, and then uh, what's called the Tiber portfolio, which is like AI edge, cloud security, all that kind of stuff. Seems like I believe Amazon's going to be starting essentially using these Xeon processors going forward. Uh, if that's the case, that will be pretty nice to have that in. Um, what did I want to say? This is what I wanted to say. So they're making a deal where they're able to have TSMC start producing, <laughs> which again, I think this also kind of shows that their, their foundry dreams uh, might be a little optimistic going forward. Um, but they were having TSMC develop some of these basically 18A process, uh, processors here. And I guess that the CEO said something that really upset the CEO of TSMC, right? So TSMC had given Intel a 40% discount on wafer production services. Obviously that's massive, right? Uh, it was a discount on three nanometer wafers, which is also super important. And then Gelsinger essentially said at a summit uh, that Taiwan is not safe. Uh, we shouldn't be putting our, our money there to develop. And, and this is him trying to get US money, right, for the CHIPS Act, uh, no doubt. Um, however, the CEO of TSMC said that's extraordinarily rude and then removed uh, that discount. They were paying 14,000 initially, and then it's the wafer cost is now 23,000. Uh, you know, that's, that's really tough in a major way. Uh, so I, I think these guys have a lot of issues ahead of them. Uh, I'm glad that people got in here and made some money on that. That's awesome. I just don't think this in any way indicates, and I mean, you know, on the yearly, uh, you know, 
look at it a daily, this isn't massive at all, right? They're, they're still off a massive uh, percent year to date. Um, but I wouldn't view this as like, okay, we're rallying back, even if you have higher than uh, normal volume, right? At least from day to day. And it really isn't that significant compared to higher volume you've seen, especially on this gap down, uh, which is, you know, pretty significant. Anyways, that's kind of my whole talk on Intel and, and why I didn't want to get into it and um, why I, I probably won't. Additionally, uh, they were just passed over uh, for 825 million chip research award, which is super brutal as well. And so I don't know. We'll say focus, but maybe you start seeing some actual stuff come out of Intel, you know, late next year. And then you can kind of talk about, all right, this stock has something going on. And who knows? Maybe the U.S. government just says, you know what? No, we, we want to dump money into these guys. But it just doesn't seem like they can even produce their kind of high-end stuff so much so that they're going to TSMC. And then they blow the discount that they have with TSMC. Uh, and, and then they don't get nearly a billion dollars in chip research. So it's kind of brutal. Let us move on. We can talk a little bit about Amazon. Actually, first, let's talk about Disney because it's just kind of a short story on it, but it is kind of nice, and I'm hoping this gives it a pop-up kind of going forward here and just kind of this general recovery of this stock um, after quite a... Yeah, so we're actually off today, but it's 95.83, so the news didn't save it at all. Uh, so Walt Disney apparently is forming a new unit to coordinate the company's use of uh, emerging technologies. This is going to be like artificial intelligence and mixed reality as the media giant explores applications across its film, television, and theme park divisions. This is from the uh, Office of Technology Enablement, which will be led uh, by Jamie Voris. He did the Disney app and all that kind of stuff. So this is a quote from him. The pace and scope of the advances in AI and extended reality are profound and will continue to impact consumer experiences, creative endeavors, and our businesses for years to come, making it critical that Disney explore the exciting opportunities and navigate the potential risks. Uh, let's see here. The unit focused on fast-moving areas of technology such as AI and mixed reality, which blends physical and digital worlds. Yeah. They, they also created a really interesting piece of technology um, where, you know, you, you wear your, your VR goggles or whatever, and you kind of move with your joysticks. And the idea is that if you can wear that, you should be able to move like normally how you would in, in, in this world. Uh, and you should be able to kind of move uh, within VR. Obviously, a major issue with that is the world in VR is not mapped to whatever you're in. So you're going to smack into things and hurt yourself. And some guys at Disney had actually created this mat, right, that they could walk on and that would propel you forward in the world. So, I mean, they've been putting money into this uh, quite a bit recently, which I think is pretty fantastic. I don't know, though, if this means we're going to see, uh, now it's not going to be the same kind of investment that you're seeing in hyperscalers who are like developing the AI or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I wonder how much money they actually put into this and if this can affect earnings uh, at some point going forward as well. But I thought that was kind of interesting to talk about um, because uh, it's kind of neat. And I think, again, it shows this is where these large companies like Microsoft and Amazon are going to start profiting off AI at some point. Uh, you know, within before the end of this decade, uh, without a doubt. Uh, let's go ahead and move quickly uh, to Amazon earnings. They actually did pretty well, too. And I think it dragged up a lot of the other tech companies, too, because I think Microsoft is a little bit positive today after a nice uh, decline yesterday. So up 6.5%. Uh, what I was really interested to read with them, you know, you had some decline in growth projected by Microsoft uh, regarding their cloud service, Azure. You know, 22 from 23, which is fine. Um, but you got a lot of people kind of selling off on some contracting growth, even though it's relatively high. And I was curious to see what is going to be with Amazon. Uh, and so this is from their Gen AI Cloud Growth Boost AWS. So AWS is, uh, they, this is what they're saying, is clearly benefiting from a shift uh, back to portioning new workloads to the cloud and generative AI boom. Uh, we think these trends are consistent with our expectations that AWS is overall key long-term driver for Amazon. No doubt this is the largest system of its kind. A management noted a multi-billion book of business from generative AI already that is growing revenue in the triple digits and growing three times faster than AWS was in its infancy. Management also confirmed that AWS is capacity constrained for generative AI usage. 
We think that these trends uh, is directionally similar to Microsoft's Azure business and that AWS is set up well for durable growth over the next couple of years. Third quarter AWS revenue growth accelerated 19% year over year, 27.5 billion compared with 19% growth last quarter and 12% a year ago. And I, and I don't see, they, they didn't necessarily have a projection of growth for 2024 that I could find in the time that I was researching all of this. So I'm, it's probably out there, but I just can't see what it is. But it makes me question, you know, why Microsoft got smacked so hard. And if that's going to be, you know, stable. I mean, today, since there's not like a massive, you know, roar back, I, you know, potentially it is. Folks, stay right there. We'll be right back. Many trading newsletters attempt to focus on a narrow set of equities or commodities. While this works for some, it oftentimes misses many opportunities that possess huge gain potential. But how is an independent trader supposed to scan the entire market looking for these hidden opportunities? One simple answer, the opening call newsletter. Basil Chapman, developer of the Chapman Wave trading methodology, has been trading the markets for longer than most trading influencers have been alive. And over that time, he has honed his methodology in order to accurately call movements in a wide range of equities, from semiconductors to uranium to key indices and so much more. Basil is old school, taking the time to educate the trader while also giving his insights into key indices, selective stocks, and more. Opening call subscribers also receive access to dozens of educational live streams that can be accessed at any time for your edification. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So ignore the pop trading influencers and start learning time-tested technical analysis. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019 finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn. And he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, educating investors. The consistency you're looking for is closer than you think. One or two adjustments are usually all you need to change your equity curve from red to green and keep it there. Come join Larry Pesavento Live to learn what separates the winners from the losers. Join Larry Pesavento on the second and fourth Friday of every month for three hours of live trading from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, where Larry will show you the market setting up and most important of all, the state of mind of a winning trader. By watching Larry trade, you'll learn the Fibonacci levels. You'll learn how to apply A to B to C to D trading patterns. You'll learn trade management, pattern recognition, and much more. Join Larry October 11th and 25th for more live trading action. Your purchase goes towards two sessions, so make sure to sign up now so you don't miss a chance to sit next to Larry as he trades the market live. For all information and to reserve your spot today, go to the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. This portion of the Tom O'Brien Show is brought to you by Direction's daily leveraged and inverse ETFs. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the direction. Visit Direction.com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Before we move on, 
just kind of chips talk and everything. Uh, let's talk about just some news with GFS. This is Global Foundries. They're not getting uh, hit super hard right now, um, but over the past few days they have been anyways. Uh, so the U.S. just imposed a $500,000 penalty against Global Foundries. Uh, I guess they're the third largest contract chip maker. It's definitely flown under the radar through all of this. Uh, they've been shipping chips to a Chinese company, and they didn't ask to be able to do that. <laughs> so the Department of Commerce uh, came out today saying that. In the statement, it said that Global Foundries had sent 74 shipments worth $17.1 million to a firm on trade restriction list known as the Entity List. Uh, exports to the firms on the list require a difficult-to-obtain license. Global Foundries didn't even try to apply for it. They just said, whatever, we're going to send it over. Uh, lawmakers from both parties have expressed concerns about uh, them doing this, essentially, and we all kind of know why, again, like these chips are used in advanced uh, kind of military technology. And so, yeah, they're getting smacked. And it's a majority owned by Abu Dhabi's Sovereign Wealth Fund, slated to receive around $1.5 billion from the Commerce Department to build a new semiconductor production facility in New York, expanding operations in Vermont. Uh, so I don't get why they would do that, but hey, whatever. I mean, it's Abu Dhabi, right? Uh, so not a lot happening on there, but just to show you kind of like how these things even get through. And there are tons of shell companies as well. Like there's no doubt in my mind that maybe it's a little bit different for NVIDIA, but I mean, heck, maybe it's not. You know what I mean? I'm sure at some point these other countries that are on that entity list are no doubt going to get it. And, and really probably through shell companies or companies that are run um, in Gulf Arab states for sure. There's a big uh, expose that occurred recently on that, and that's how a lot of chips from TSMC were getting into China, uh, was this kind of weird um, export company in uh, the Gulf Arab states. Uh, let's, I guess, move on to uranium. Because I think there's a lot to talk about today. Uh, let's go to Energy Fuels, because they released... And I think this does change a little bit what we could be doing in this. So they're off 5.23% today. They had earnings, right? So let's take a look at that. Yeah, so they lost about 0 0.07 cents as opposed to an estimated 0 0.5 there. Um, I, I'm trying to read through this company. They have their news releases and stuff like that. Very interesting company. It seems like it's actually not necessarily a bad company, right? They don't have any debt. They have 180 million um, in assets, no debt, which is really solid. They have 47.46 million of cash and cash equivalents, 101 million of marketable securities, and uh, 35.9 million of inventory and no debt. They have benefited pretty heavily, right? So they have contracts with the U.S. government, um, and these contracts essentially can, can float the price at which they're going to sell that tri uranium to the government for, which is nice, especially when you're getting an increase in the price of uranium. Yet this chart from Kamiko, if I can get this loaded in a quick fashion, that I think does demonstrate that there is here. Okay, let's do this. That there is potential to be made here, right? So this is nice with Kamiko. Either your mind supply here. This is demand for net zero, which is what we're aiming for. This is demand on the base case. Uh, this is obviously getting projected into the 30s. And this is, I think, something to like keep in mind, right? You're going to get these massive pump-ins to these uranium stocks on a lot of news, right? So Amazon's looking to do it. Amazon's going to now pay more money to get these SMRs. Uh, Microsoft is you know, now paying for uh, Three Mile Island to get, you know, back online essentially, right? But it's not moving the spot price of uranium, which is where these guys are going to end up making more money, right? It's still tied in that kind of traditional sector, right? So I think that if you like the uranium play for the long term, you can see these kind of moments as like an ability to DCA or just get in, right? Because my, my fear with things like UEC and even Kamiko to some certain extent, uh, although I think UEC and Kamiko are a little bit better positioned than energy fuels, um, is, is you're not going to get stellar reports that are going to kind of reflect uh, these massive moves up. On the long term, that absolutely will happen. And I think, you know, I mean, 
it's not like there's more supply of this stuff, right? They, they are obviously finding more veins and that does ease fears at some certain point. Um, but as it stands now, all this talk is not moving the spot price, which is really what's going to start delivering solid um, quarterlies and earnings reports from these uranium companies. So, I mean, even with like UEC, right? I mean, you have fantastic volume on that high. It is pulling back down to that gap and consolidating a little bit. It broke down a little bit more on lighter volume. But if you get earnings that come out, they're, they're not going to be fantastic most likely, right? Because a lot of uranium is still not being utilized the way that it's going to be. So this is like a super long-term plate. Now, when you look at stuff from, let's say, the business, the enterprise kind of level, right? I think Microsoft has taken kind of a different approach where they're trying to put these big nuclear reactors back online. Uh, so basically co-locating power. And then you had uh, the Federal Energy Regulation Committee. They are having an, basically a, a meeting today on this kind of concept of co-location on these massive hyperscalers that are gonna you know, need to be powering these server racks. And they're essentially saying that we don't have enough power in any capacity. And uh, we're going to need double the power we have now by something like 2030. I would really recommend going on YouTube like after the show today and checking that out. If you if you want it, I will send you that video link. But I mean, this conversation is here, right? And this kind of sets up in the next few months for some other, you know, fantastic run ups in energy hype that you're going to sell on those high volume highs, wait for it to pull back down and then DCA. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we're talking 10 years from now or whatever. So, you know, your kids or your grandkids, you can also tell them to do this kind of stuff. I mean, uranium is going to be dominant. We, we, we can produce all the natural gas we want, all the oil, especially if Trump gets in. We're going to be producing more and more oil that's going to be used, but it's still not going to be enough energy. And this is what these experts at the federal government are bringing in and saying, right? And they're worried about it. So as it stands now, I, I, I think in the short term, you, it's going to still be bad earnings and you're going to get the sell off. But think about it. If you like uranium is kind of an opportunity uh, to get in on it um, because that's that's kind of what I'm doing with it as well. I think what's interesting about UUU as well is they are mining vanadium, which is kind of interesting. I know uh, we had some people in the den uh, talking about uh, vanadium batteries, uh, which is super fascinating. They actually did not sell anything at that time uh, in last quarter and they're just kind of holding on to it and I'm not sure what the uh, demand right now for that rare earth material is. Uh, folks, there right there, we'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. For traders who crave risk, Direction's daily leveraged and inverse ETFs provide opportunities to magnify short-term perspectives with up to three times a daily leverage, utilize bull and bear funds from both sides of the trade, and trade through rapidly changing markets. These are highly leveraged ETFs with daily resetting designed for short-term trading, not long-term investing. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the Direction. For up-to-date pricing and performance, go to Direction. Dot com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. The reality is that navigating financial markets can be risky. Markets can be chaotic and difficult to understand. Having the latest market advice can help you turn this chaos into a key for creating winning trades. 
At TFNN, we understand that it can be hard to find reliable market news. That's why each of our market experts offers their very own market newsletter, a must-have tool for every trader out there striving to find an edge in today's markets. TFNN newsletters cover every aspect of the markets so you can analyze the market before you trade. Try any of our great newsletters risk-free with our 30-day money-back guarantee. Just visit the Newsletters tab on the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger Zen, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right, welcome back, everyone. Before we move on from uranium, just something to note about um, energy fuels. They are stockpiling the uranium. They believe there's massive tailwinds. Yeah, I think we can kind of see that as well, but it's a question of, you know, when do we start seeing these nuclear reactors come online and spot prices be good? Seems like their their major you know customers are going to be the U.S. military. One of the things to note is it seemed like they had they didn't say by how much or you know whatever, but they they did have to buy uranium at spot price uh, in order to complete or you know satisfy the agreements of their contract, which obviously cuts into earnings. So that's some, that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. All right, let's move on to. Uh, talk about Bitcoin a little bit. Actually, no, let's talk about is this on here? electric vehicles. This is something kind of like interesting. Now, let's see, that doesn't come up on that. You essentially had like Baidu do very well, but this is just report that I had for electric vehicle sales, right? And we have this kind of concept uh, that electric vehicles are kind of on the downward pull, at least in the short term. I've had a lot of emails from people saying that. Uh, Rivian did have a deal right now with a windmill farm to power a lot of its plants, whatever. That doesn't help them become profitable. It seems like they're going to continue to have an unprofitable Q4, uh, which is unfortunate uh, because that was earlier this year when they said they were going to uh, achieve profitability. Uh, really interesting thing from PwC here. And this is, uh, EV is a massive market, right? So China is... Obviously, the, the massive consumer of EVs. EVs in total, more than three million EVs were sold in China in Q3 24. Their exports have shot up more than doubling during the first three quarters of 2024 year on year. The EU believes the state subsidies have awarded China OEMs an unfair cost advantage. That's why we're seeing uh, essentially massive tariffs uh, of nearly 100% on Chinese EVs over there. Other countries and regions are also doing okay. EV sales are dominant in the top five Euro, uh, European markets, comprising 56% of all new registrations, which is nuts. More than a third of all vehicles sold in these markets were hybrids. So keep that in mind as well, that they're hybrids, not pure EVs. The United Kingdom is the most buoyant within Europe, uh, European top five, uh, with the share alone now sitting at 20%. And then the United States market, which I thought was interesting, also continues to develop steadily with total EV growth market share passing 20% for the first time in Q3 2024. Um, and then, of course, Norway, but they're always on that kind of new stuff. So I, I think, you know, I, I do get emails from people being like, I, you know, the EV craze is going to go away. This is nothing. I mean, this is a, some pretty significant growth, even at a time, too, where we've been seeing, um, you know, like Ford, for instance, are going to stop some production on their electric pickup trucks. It, I mean, it, there's the potential that this could be much more you know, headlines like that are just much more to do with whatever is going on in that company as opposed to the general demand. Um, it's just kind of some interesting food for thought going forward. Uh, you have, yeah, Bitcoin shooting up and then uh, you have JP Morgan coming out today 
which is kind of interesting because you've had a lot of capital inflows coming into these Bitcoin ETFs. So JP Morgan team, this is from them, looked at speculative demand from institutional investors by examining US commodity futures and trade commission data. They find a bullish impulse in gold and Bitcoin futures, not in Ethereum, kind of interesting. Uh, this is a quote from JP Morgan's analyst team. To us, this suggests that speculative institutional investors such as hedge, fund, hedge funds might see gold and Bitcoin as similar assets, both, uh, both as beneficiaries of the so-called, quote, debasement trades. So when other currencies get debased uh, outside of the U.S., that's when you get, you know, in, conceptually speaking, that's when you get stuff like gold uh, ramping up in a major way. And uh, it seems like they're from that debasement trade, what gold was doing, they're also seeing Bitcoin doing that uh, as well. And that could explain some of the massive uh, capital inflows you're getting. Although it is interesting to see them talking about that when you had, and I really am using this as a barometer, uh, partly, there's other things as well for what the market thinks gonna happen. Now this this is also uh, just gambling with DJT and it has no real like basis. Um, but you know, you had this massive run up and the sentiment essentially was, you know, he's gonna win and it comes down. Of course you have the gambling markets betting that he's gonna win, but you know, I feel like, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to go into that, but I'm not trying not to go into politics in any capacity. But you also do have JP Morgan now talking about, you know, in this event, you know, we're going to start. Uh, not weird, but hedge funds are looking to get into Bitcoin essentially, right? In the event that Donald uh, J. Trump wins. Kind of interesting to see. And it also lies in, again, with massive uh, cash inflows to these kind of Bitcoin ETFs, which I think is kind of cool. Coinbase, however, has tumbled uh, pretty heavily. Let's take a look here. And some of these meme coins are popping up too. If you guys got into that, like send me an email and tell me what happened because that is impressive to see. So yeah, massive downward slump here. Uh, total revenue, this is on earnings. Again, total revenue increased 1.21 billion. That was less than analyst forecast of 1.25. Net income was 75 million. That's pretty low. Um, you know, below the 112.2 million expected by analysts. The company lost 2.3 million in the year ago period. An accounting change first adopted in the second quarter resulted in Coinbase pricing its digital assets to market value, resulting in a 121 million pre-tax loss in the most recent quarter. This is a quote from them, overall results fell short of expectations, but we do see Coinbase continuing to execute in emerging areas of its business, welcoming potential avenues of future growth. Coinbase said in a shareholder letter on uh, uh, Wednesday this week uh, that it expects current quarter subscriptions and services revenue to be between 505 million and 580. That is a pretty large uh, span between the two of that. Uh, in October, the company said it generated 190 million in transaction revenue. And yeah, I mean, for such a long time in October, it's just kind of bizarre. There, there wasn't like the inflow you were usually seeing. And I don't know if that has to do with election anxiety. I mean, it seems like economists or, or you know, pe people, I guess, who are maybe more inclined to be, uh, you know, center or center left um, are, are pushing kind of concepts of uh, essentially, you know, we, we went over the other day of like, you know, high tax rate on Bitcoin or uh, outright banning it because it messes up with Fed policies and stuff like that. And uh, you did again have Kamala come out recently and said that she wants to develop a framework which people could trade in Bitcoin. So that should have been bullish and you just kind of weren't seeing that um, in a major way, which is a little bit bizarre. Tether's getting investigated, which is kind of interesting. They, they did say that they uh, had a third quarter profit of 2.5 billion, which is pretty solid. Let's see here. Um, we released the information as part of third-party attestation to the BDO. Uh, the market value of Tether's USDD token in circulation has climbed almost 120 billion as demand for stable coins rose. Now, again, they're getting investigated. Um, essentially, the government is alleging that they are essentially, they didn't say facilitating, but in some capacity, what their product does is allow um, criminals, international criminals, uh, to conduct business, uh, which is not uh, super fantastic. We'll talk about Starbucks a little bit when we get back uh, from the break.
Many trading newsletters attempt to focus on a narrow set of equities or commodities. While this works for some, it oftentimes misses many opportunities that possess huge gain potential. But how is an independent trader supposed to scan the entire market looking for these hidden opportunities? One simple answer, the opening call newsletter. Basil Chapman, developer of the Chapman Wave trading methodology, has been trading markets for longer than most trading influencers have been alive. And over that time, he has honed his methodology in order to accurately call movements in a wide range of equities, from semiconductors to uranium to key indices and so much more. Basil is old school, taking the time to educate the trader while also giving his insights into key indices, selective stocks, and more. Opening Call subscribers also receive access to dozens of educational live streams that can be accessed at any time for your edification. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So ignore the pop trading influencers and start learning time-tested technical analysis. In the world of trading, only a few names stand out like Larry Pesavento. A pro's pro with over 50 years of experience, Larry has seen it all. A former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member, Larry has authored 10 books and trained over 1,000 traders with his unmatched expertise. Introducing Fibonacci 24-7, Larry Pesavento's daily trading service that turns the complexity of markets into opportunities. Published every Sunday, receive a comprehensive report packed with detailed commentary, charts, and videos that illuminate the patterns shaping the markets with updates throughout the week exclusively for subscribers. Whether through charts or videos, Larry's analysis is your roadmap to navigating the markets. You can sign up now at TFNN.com for just $97. And with all TFNN newsletters backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to risk. For all the details, visit TFNN.com. You'll find Fibonacci 24-7 right under the Newsletters tab. The reality is that navigating financial markets can be risky. Markets can be chaotic and difficult to understand. Having the latest market advice can help you turn this chaos into a key for creating winning trades. At TFNN, we understand that it can be hard to find reliable market news. That's why each of our market experts offers their very own market newsletter. A must-have tool for every trader out there striving to find an edge in today's markets. TFNN newsletters cover every aspect of the markets so you can analyze the market before you trade. Try any of our great newsletters risk-free with our 30-day money-back guarantee. Just visit the Newsletters tab on the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, everyone. This is Jacob Shoop. You are watching the Tom O'Brien Show. We just have a short segment here. About to be the weekend. Very nice. So, you know, you have the new CEO at Starbucks, they're removing a lot of stuff. You have same store sales declining 2%, consolidated net revenues increasing uh, 1%, also 1% increase on constant uh, currency basis. It seems like they, the, the new CEO is really trying to reel in all the stuff they've been doing and just try to figure out what works. Something that I think is important to note, though, going forward, it seems like they are having issues uh, in China, which is kind of what we were talking about uh, maybe like six months ago where the Chinese, you know, one, they're kind of going through uh, some tough economic times relative to what usually happens with them. Um, of course, they're still in a growth environment, but just not as strong uh, as, you know, it had been prior. But then additionally, they are starting to buy more like Chinese things, right? America's had this privilege for a very long time of being like, I want to buy American. Uh, when I was in a certain Eastern European country that really had some of the best coffee I ever had in these really small mom and pop shops, everyone actually wanted just to go to Starbucks uh, because it had that aura to it. Uh, I, I think that is kind of slipping a little bit in China. We've seen that, uh, you know, with Nike as well. Uh, so one thing I want to bring up is since we have the election coming up on Tuesday of next week, there are apparently this is from the uh, Odini, FBI and CISA. This is really important to understand if you guys are online. Um, I had watched the video. You know, it, it seemed a little bit 
kind of weird uh, to me when I had first seen it, uh, but they're saying that videos of migrants voting was Russian propaganda. You know, you always have to do your own thoughts on these things, but there is no doubt this kind of secret battle that goes on between all these major countries um, trying to essentially screw with each other. You know, one of the things I would say is since they were, you know, Haitian, you got to keep in mind, like, that is kind of the ongoing joke, you know what I mean, with the Haitian comments and stuff like that. Just, just be aware of, like, these kind of continuing contexts and almost, like, parts of the joke that continue on. And just be aware of what you're consuming, you know, make your decision, vote who you're going to vote for, but just be sure uh, that you're not getting caught up in some of this kind of stuff. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you Monday. Building 